America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again for another week of eye-gouging, crotch-kicking, no-holds-barred political discussion right here on TFRlive.com, Truth Frequency Radio, and the iHeartRadio app. Glad you are with us this late Sunday evening, wherever you are around the world or across the United States of America, for our first show of 2022. Happy New Year to you all. As we emanate to you, as always, from the Joe McCarthy Memorial Studios on the outskirts of war-torn St. Louis, Missouri, we're refreshed and ready to go. We took last week off, of course, to celebrate Christmas with the family and to take a trip down into God's country of the Ozark Mountains in southwest Missouri and become reacquainted with how normal people live we had a great time, and we're back and raring to go here. So we hope all of you had a wonderful Christmas and a happy new year. And, of course, a special shout-out to all of you out there in the audience who have been celebrating Kwanzaa for the last week. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. Nobody celebrates that made-up holiday. But I... I I can't believe I got through that line with a straight face. Yeah. Have a holly jolly Kwanzaa, everybody. (laughs) Anyhow, glad to be back on the airwaves with you this Sunday night. And for those of you who have been our longtime listeners, those of you who have been around for a number of years listening to us on this program, You are probably pretty familiar with what is going to happen this week. Uh, You are aware of what we do this time every year. This is our annual New New Year's message. We do one of these every year when we get to the first show after the New Year. I always take a moment to examine where we are politically and societally and not necessarily give you an address that predicts anything for the upcoming year so much as as I try to I try to walk you through maybe a game plan for how we should proceed in the upcoming year um, how we move forward I don't want to say marching orders or anything like that but uh, kind of a look ahead to what we can expect and, and how we should react to it and how we should go on the offense going forward. I've done that every year now since we've been on the air in the, I guess it's been six going on seven years we've been on TFR. Tonight will be no different. And whenever I, uh, whenever I put together one of these New Year's messages, one of the first things I do every year is I go back and and go through my New Year's message from the year before and kind of refamiliarize myself with it and, and, and consider the question of, okay, how did we do or what happened based on what we said last year? I kind of review just in my own mind the last 365 days. And I don't want to rehash for you everything I said in my 2021 New Year's message. You can look it up in the archives if you're so inclined. But the basic crux of last year's New Year message was that the primary fight of 2021 would not so much be Republicans versus Democrats, but instead it would be an even bigger fight between normal Americans and the professional class. Now, professional class is a term I've used from time to time on this program It's a term that, as far as I know, I've coined. I don't really ever hear it anywhere else. And and sometimes new listeners aren't familiar with what I mean by that, or that they they don't understand specifically what I'm talking about. When I say the professional class, I'm talking about government, yes, but I'm talking about more than just government. I'm talking about all sorts of institutions who believe it is their role in life to manage our behavior and manage society. Yes, that includes the federal government. Yes, that includes the bureaucracy. But it also includes people like journalists. It also includes people like academics and professors and and universities and colleges. It also includes 
uh, what you might call trendsetters or, or influencers in the pop culture world. All of these people, this cadre of people that all work together to force society to go in a certain direction, who believe they are experts, who believe they and only they are qualified to direct us, the unwashed masses, that's what I refer to as the professional class. It's beyond just government. I rail on the government a lot on this program, but they're not alone in their nefariousness, and I believe the term professional class encapsulates that to some degree. So I told you in the 2021 New Year's message that the fight of 2021 would be between normal Americans and the professional class. And boy, has that turned out to be 100% correct. And I don't say that to brag. I don't say that to say, see, I told you so. Look how brilliant I was 365 days ago. Folks, I wish I would have been completely wrong on that. I wish I would have whiffed on that statement or on that prediction. I wish 2021 had been a year that after the first few months of COVID, we would have come to our senses and said, okay, we've seen how destructive and dangerous it can be when government entities come into play and try to run our lives. So we're going to take some freedom back. We're going to, we're going to operate as individuals now, and, and we're going to make our own decisions. I wish... 2021 would have played out that way, but as you and I both know, it did not. And furthermore, in last year's New Year's message, I said to you that the fundamental question of 2021 was this. Do the American people need to be governed? Do the American people as individuals need to be managed? Or are we far better off left to our own devices? That was the question I left you with in last year's New Year's message. Well, I don't think I have to go through the formality with you of asking, how did that turn out? When I ask that question, do the American people need to be governed? Do we need to be managed as individuals? Or are we better off left to our own devices? The one thing I think all of us could admit is that over the last 365 days, we certainly have been governed. We certainly have been managed by both the federal government and assorted other institutions. Whether you are a fan of collectivism or you are a detractor of it, one thing is for certain, you and I and all of us have lived through an era of collectivist operation in our society for the last year, really for the last two years. We've seen how it's played out. It's a little bit trite to give you examples of how that has played out last year and indeed the year before. But for the sake of clarity, I will mention just a few. We are all experiencing economic issues right now. Those economic issues that we face in this country are traced directly back to the overreaction to COVID that came forth from various institutions and then by government at all levels. The supply chain issues that we face even today The empty shelves you see at your stores, the difficulty you have getting certain items, certain products that you desire to have or maybe that you even need. I've even seen cases in the last few months where prescriptions that I have have been delayed because they weren't in. I can't be the only one who's gone through that. Those supply chain issues, those are the direct result of our over-governance of our top-down management that we've had to to deal with. The workforce issues you're seeing right now, all of that traces back to the government and institutional overreaction to COVID and their opportunistic efforts to intervene in our lives where they were not asked to do so before. 
And since that time, you've seen throughout 2021 the continual push for mitigations and actions in the face of COVID, even even as the American people have really started to tire of it, and most of us have said, to hell with this, we're going to go back and live our regular lives, aside from those of you in New York and California and a couple of places where you're continuing to stick to this. And so we have an Omicron variant that comes out, which from day one was acknowledged, this Omicron variant has far more mild of symptoms, or no symptoms at all in some cases, compared to the Delta variant or other forms of of the Chinese virus that we've seen in the last two years. We've seen it's comparatively much more mild. And yet, these same actors in the professional class, your government folks, your institutional folks, your CDC, your journalists, your academics, and all of them have reacted to the Omicron variant and the spread of it as though this was the most deadly plague that humankind has ever run across. You see the news come on almost every night right now and talk about how the Omicron virus, the Omicron variant is spreading all over the place. How it is, it is now the dominant variant of the virus that's spreading through this nation. And if you stop and think about it and you take a step back, you'd say, wait a second. So you're telling me the variant that's more mild and therefore less harmful is the one that's dominant now? Isn't that a good thing? Isn't that something we should be celebrating? Isn't that a positive step forward? You would think so, but if you hear the journalists or the media or Joe Biden or Democratic lawmakers talk about it, they would frame it a very different way. They would frame it as how how scared we all should be. And my God, we must all go out and get our vaccinations. We must all go out and get our boosters. We must all wear our masks 24-7. And you had people in Times Square in New York City kissing each other with masks on, and you had to wonder if, you know, later on in the night, once they got down and got busy with each other, if they wore full-body condoms like that one seen in The Naked Gun. I don't know, but it's all becoming a little too crazy now, isn't it? And it's gotten to the point of ridiculousness now when the last couple of weeks of the year we have seen major sports leagues in this country holding players out of games and postponing games and even canceling some bowl games because of the spread of Omicron, the more mild variant. And what's so interesting about that is a couple of things here, folks. Because in a great, the great multitude, the great majority of cases of these sports leagues, when, when teams have had to postpone games or hold players out or they even had to po- you know, cancel bowls or whatever, in nearly all of these cases, the players that tested positive were asymptomatic. They, they had no symptoms. They just... You know, had a test that came up as as COVID, as the the Omicron variant. But they felt fine. They were operating in their daily lives normally. There was really no reason that they couldn't play in a realistic sense. But no, because we've because we bought into the COVID is deadly myth. Uh, we we have to we have to radically change our sports and so forth. And beyond that. When it comes to our professional sports and even our college sports and the question of vaccinations, there's hardly a group of people out there anywhere in the country that have a higher percentage of vaccinations than professional and college athletes. You know, so so you've got, you know, in, in, in the sports leagues, you've got, you've got, in most cases, well over 90% of the players having been vaccinated and yet they're having COVID outbreaks. And these COVID outbreaks they're having are largely asymptomatic. When you put it all together, it's ridiculous as hell, isn't it? 
I was driving down to uh, to the Ozarks last week for Christmas, and uh, I was listening to the the NHL channel on satellite radio on Sirius XM. And I, I don't remember all the details of it because I was driving. I wasn't researching for the show or anything. I just happened to hear this. They were ta- they had talked to a coach of a hockey team. I believe it was the Edmonton Oilers, and he'd relayed the story that. You know, he had X number of players that were that, that had tested positive for COVID, and so he couldn't play those players. But yet, when they were up, it may not have been the coach of the Oilers. It may have been the coach for another team that went up and played at Edmonton. That may be what it was. So when his hockey team goes up and plays in Edmonton, of course, Edmonton this time of year is freaking cold as hell. They go up there, and a couple of their players actually get a head cold, and and that kind of spreads to the team, and those. Those players obviously don't feel well, and they're sick, and they normally can't play. But yet, according to the COVID rules, those players who had the head cold, they could play. But the players who got the tested positive for COVID and were asymptomatic, they couldn't play. And they're pointing out, pointing out how ridiculous it was, and it really was ridiculous. And it was a little bit interesting to see some of the folks on Sports Talk Radio saying, hey, why are we why are we canceling games and why are we holding players out who test positive and are asymptomatic, you know? And that was a change because I've seen throughout the year Sports Talk Radio had been one of the entities that have been all in on the COVID porn, COVID paranoia stuff, but they seem to be coming around now because they're seeing the ridiculousness of it. And so I noticed that and I thought that was interesting. Because when you take a step back, And you look at how COVID has been pushed to us by the professional class and by the federal government as something that is super dangerous, super deadly, even though the death rate has always been below 5% on this thing. And how it is so important that we get our vaccines and how it is, it, it is unconscionable that anyone would object to the federal government using OSHA to force, force businesses to force their employees to get vaccines. All they ever tell you is how important the vaccines are. You must get vaccinated. You must get your booster. You must, 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 must. And yet we're seeing now a mild variant go through sports teams that are vaccinated. And they're asymptomatic. And it really wouldn't hurt anything if they did play. But they don't dare play because they've been convinced or have convinced themselves that they just shouldn't do so because it's so super dangerous. How? No one can really say. That is an example. That is a microcosm of what the professional class and the government have done to us in 2021. They have driven us to the point where we're no longer trusting our own judgment, some of us. We're no longer looking at the realistic facts on the ground, but we're buying into a narrative that doesn't actually match up with what we're seeing and what we're experiencing. And you know what was interesting about this in the last part of the year, the last part of December? Senile Uncle Joe actually admitted something, and I don't know if he meant to do this or if it slipped out, I'm not sure. But we've we've been through this whole year of the government telling us how dangerous this is and how we're supposed to, we must get vaccinated and all of this, and yet we see in the sports world and in other areas how ridiculous it all was as it all was played out. And we have Biden actually admitting to some governors that there is, to use his words, no federal solution to COVID. Well, no spit, Sherlock. We've been telling you that since day one. We've been telling you that since March of 2020, you senile imbecile. And you ran a whole campaign on how you had a plan to defeat COVID. You had a plan to destroy COVID. And the only way, the only way we can survive COVID is through federal government interference. And you criticized President Trump for not doing enough at the federal level to interact with COVID. And I've always said that President Trump deserves it, but will never get an intense amount of credit for his restraint during COVID, for not allowing the federal government 
to step out of their bounds. But you, Biden, and you supporters, you criticized President Trump for it. You said you'd do something different. You ran and, and think you won an office, and then you actually cheated your way to it on the shoulders of the idea that we would have massive federal interference for COVID. You get in office by hook or by crook. You do massively interfere in the private sector on the basis of COVID. And guess what? It doesn't work. And now you've admitted it. You are a fraud all along. Fauci was a fraud all along. The CDC were frauds all along. It's all bullshit shenanigans. Nice of you to, be, to, to show up here now that you're late to the party, Biden. But millions of Americans have already realized this over the last two years. But you know something? Biden's statement that there's no federal solution to COVID, sure, it may have been a slip on his part. It may have been a senile and doddering old man accidentally saying a truthful thing he wasn't supposed to say. But then again, if I look at history, as I often do, it's not the only time that I've seen a liberal politician have to finally admit that the federal government can't be the be-all and end-all of solving our problems the way they purport. See, there's a pattern here. America comes across a problem, or in the case of COVID, America ha America is told by a professional class that a huge problem exists and we must do something, even if we're unsure that such a huge problem exists. We're told that, and then the federal government moves heaven and earth to do all these different huge invasive things in the name of that problem, and it doesn't work even though they told us it would, and then they have to admit, well, yeah, we really can't solve the problem because we're the federal government. This isn't the only time that's happened. I take you back to Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter, 1976, he ran on the idea that we need to have a federal government that works for the American people. By golly, he was a good man. He was a moral farmer from Georgia. And he, by God, was going to make sure that government worked for us instead of against us at long last. That's what Jimmy Carter was supposed to do. But as you know by now, if you have any sense of history or recollection, the presidency of Jimmy Carter was an abject disaster. Economic problems, stagflation, oil shortages, you name it. A malaise you've heard talk about going over the nation. And one time, Jimmy Carter actually had to do what Biden did and admit the same thing. Jimmy Carter once said, and I quote, government cannot solve our problems, it can't set our goals, it cannot define our vision, end quote. Nice of you to say that, Jimmy. It would have been nice if you'd have recognized that early on and not tried to have government intervene in our lives to the point that it made things worse. Same thing for Joe Biden. It's nice that you see there's no federal solution, but it would have been nicer if you'd have seen that years ago and not tried to interject to begin with and make things worse as far as our economy goes, make things worse as far as our work our, our workforce goes, make things worse as far as our supply chain goes, make things worse as far as our freedom goes, make things worse as far as our opportunity to make our own health care decisions go. That would have been nice, but you did it anyway, and then you come out with a mea culpa when you finally realize and get it through your thick geriatric skull that it didn't work. You see, this is what leftists do. Contrary to popular belief, leftists will sometimes admit and acknowledge once everything goes pear-shaped, they will sometimes admit and acknowledge that in the end, government, and the federal government particularly, actually cannot solve our problems. Now, up until that point, they will move heaven and earth to convince you that government not only can solve problems, 
but are really the only mechanism that can solve problems. That is a key tenet to their beliefs, a key tenet to their being, but on occasion, once every 20 years or so, when it finally becomes clear that the government has tried to solve a problem and made it so, so much worse than it ever would have been before, then, yeah, they've got to admit it. But the problem is, when they admit it, they never acknowledge government's role in making things massively worse than they would have been had they not tried to solve our problems. Biden's not admitted to that. Carter never admitted to that. None of those jackholes ever admit to it. Well, that's where we stand right now. At the end of 2021, the federal government and the professional class have egg on their face. And so after the break, I'll come back with a second part of my New Year's message where I tell you what we do about it. Right after this here on TFRlive.com. 